we are thrilled to have our author with us today, Peter Canellas, an award-winning writer and the executive editor of Politico. We're here today to listen and to talk about his newest book, The Great Dissenter, the story of John Marshall Harlan, America's judicial hero. Harlan, of course, was born and raised in Kentucky and would become an associate justice on the Supreme Court and serve for 34 years. This oil painting, to let you know of Harlan, is in our collection here at the Fraser. We have the portraits of eight of the Supreme Court justices who are from Kentucky. This came to us, just to let you know, by way of Hardin County Museum of History and Art and was painted by Barbara Gaffney from official photographs of portraits of, of all the justices. Now, those eight justices also include Louis Brandeis. Of course, the UofL Law School is named after him. And our colleague, UofL's Laura Rothstein, is going to talk more about the connections between Harlan and that law school coming up in just a moment. And as our guest Peter Canellis writes, many cases during Harlan's tenure on the court came to be regarded as disastrous for the country, including Plessy versus Ferguson, as well as others. Harlan dissented on all of them, and it would be Harlan's views that would provide the legal structure of the 20th century. So, of course, it begs the question that Canellis wrote himself in a recent op-ed, if you read it in the Courier-Journal, how did a man who refused to embrace abolition before the Civil War emerge as the court's foremost advocate for civil rights afterwards? This is a book about personal and political transformations and solving some of the mystery that surrounds Harlan. We have two other introductory speakers who are our partners in today's program. Laura Rothstein, professor of law and distinguished university scholar from the University of Louisville Brandeis School of Law. But first, another of our partners, the Louisville Bar Association's executive director, Scott Furkin. Thank you, Rachel, and greetings all. I bring you greetings on behalf of the Louisville Bar Association, the oldest continuously operating bar association in Kentucky. Uh, officially founded on January 13th, two, uh, 1900, uh, the roots of the LBA can be traced to 1871, uh, when a group of Louisville lawyers, including one John Marshall Harlan, began meeting to discuss certain legal reforms. And those meetings led to passage of a state law that guaranteed that no person could be uh, prohibited from testifying in court on the basis of race or color. So the roots of the LBA go back a long time. Uh, we've been involved in the civic life of the Commonwealth throughout our 121-year history. Just a couple of highlights. Uh, in the mid-70s, we helped advocate for passage of a constitutional amendment that created the uh, four-tier court system that we, we now have. And then more recently, in the early 2000s, we helped advocate for another uh, constitutional amendment that made family courts a permanent part of our state judiciary. So we're proud um, of our history, and we're proud of uh, the work that we still have before us, and uh, it's a pleasure to be a part of this program today. Thanks. The audience here physically is smaller than we had originally planned, but we know there is a large virtual audience today. I know my property students are all watching, hopefully live, and if, if not, they will be able to link up. And also the students from the Central High Law and Government Magnet Program are watching uh, either right now or they will be able to watch the link later. I want to thank um, Dean Lars Smith for his enthusiastic support of the sponsorship. Because when Rachel called me, I said, I'm not the dean anymore, so I can't uh, tell you yes, but I'm pretty sure that he will. And, and of course, that was not hard at all. And he also hosted uh, our faculty with uh, our guest speaker today, yesterday. And I got to spend the whole day with Peter, and it was delightful. And I've got a preview of what uh, treat you're in for. Our law school has many long and strong connections with Justice Harlan and with others in the community that made this program possible. Wilson Wyatt, former mayor of Louisville and graduate of our law school, gave an endowment to the law school many years ago to establish a fund to bring distinguished scholars to speak in our community. Dean Smith supported using those funds from that endowment to bring our speaker here to Louisville. Owsley Brown Frazier, who established the Frazier Museum in 2004, was recognized in 2002 as a law alumni fellow. He was a 1960 graduate of a law school 
and I had the privilege of getting to know him during my time as dean. Justice Harlan himself, although not connected to the law school during his lifetime, was certainly part of the Louisville and Kentucky communities. While Harlan was not from Louisville, he lived and practiced law in Louisville for a number of years before he was appointed to the Supreme Court. Louis Brandeis was childhood friends with Harlan's children. It was Louis Brandeis who arranged for our law school to have Harlan's papers through his connection with the family. And we have a Harlan, uh, the conference room that we had lunch with the dean in yesterday, and I've realized that I'm gonna have the poster uh, framed and a picture of Peter, and so that will be added to the Harlan room uh, to, to uh, share the legacy that he has brought, in, brought for us today. Peter Canellis uses storytelling to take facts and turn them into wonderful, dramatic, and interesting stories. And uh, as I was reading the book, uh, I, I was, you know, I was imagining the scenes and so on. It was very vivid and uh, written like a novel. And uh, I got to see how Peter talks so passionately about his story and his history. He does it in a way, as I said, that reads like a novel, weaving stories of his background, experiences, and his Kentucky roots and his family connections. These roots made Harlan the person he was and brought him to be the great dissenter. Peter Canellis is an award-winning journalist. He is a former editorial page editor of the Boston Globe and current managing editor of Politico. He also edited the 2009 book, The Last Lion, The, Fir the Fall and Rise of Ted Kennedy. It's a great privilege to introduce Peter Canellis. This is such a beautiful place and it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be in Louisville. I especially want to thank Rachel Platt who really went so far beyond the call of duty in making this a special event. Uh, and Laura Rothstein for a terrific day yesterday uh, at the Brandeis School. Uh, and also to Scott and the Bar Association and, uh, and everybody else, uh, all of you here who have made this uh, such a wonderful, wonderful visit. I want to start by telling you why I think John Marshall Harlan is important. And I know it's kind of unusual for me to be talking to an audience here uh, that really knows Harlan. Uh, most of the people around the country, uh, when I talk to them or uh, speak on uh, Zoom meetings, uh, more likely these days, um, they always ask me, you know, why Harlan? Why, why were you ever attracted to Harlan? And the answer is, it's been about between maybe um, 100 and 140 years uh, since Harlan's tenure on the court, his long 34-year tenure on the court. And, and we now know from the perspective that we have, we can look at that era and we can tell, you know, who was right, who was wrong, how things played out, which predictions uh, came to pass, which predictions did not come to pass. We also can tell uh, what was important and what wasn't important in that era. So when we think back on that time, which is also known as the Gilded Age, two things uh, really stand out, actually leap out. Uh, one of them is, it was the start of segregation, and we know what a disaster that was for the United States, not just for victims of segregation, primarily for victims, African-American victims of segregation, but it, it tore at the fabric, the civic fabric of our country and created wounds that, that still haven't healed. We also knew that it was a period of tremendous income inequality, and many of us who have immigrant uh, ancestors, including myself, you know, heard stories of people working, you know, two and three jobs, living, you know, four and five to a room, everybody working, but no one having enough money to really even have decent housing. And at the same time now, you know, we all go, especially those of us in the Northeast, but also down here, you go to visit the Vanderbilt homes, you visit the Rockefeller homes, you visit uh, Newport, Rhode Island, and you see uh, that some members of society were building uh, uh, palaces modeled on Louis XIV. And you wonder, how did that level of inequality come to exist? Well, the answer to both of these questions, in retrospect, is the Supreme Court, uh, in the case of uh, uh, racial relations, uh, knocked out the Civil Rights Act of, of 1875. The political branches passed it, passed a civil rights law. It was the Supreme Court that said uh, no to civil rights. The Supreme Court refused to enforce voting rights, despite a very clear mandate in the Constitution, absolutely refused. Uh, then in Plessy v. Ferguson, the Supreme Court endorsed the legal architecture of segregation. Again, despite a specific grant in the Constitution of equal protection. 
On the uh, economic side, there was the will starting in the 1890s to start to deal with some of the terrible excesses in the economy, particularly monopolization, right, which was setting prices and setting wages. So they passed the Sherman Antitrust Act, named for John Sherman, the senator from next door, Ohio, and um, the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional, essentially, uh, for a period of time. Uh, they also passed an income tax. You know, the government was funded through tariffs, which meant that every piece of basic goods, every piece of bread, basically, had a, a premium put on it to help pay for the government. That obviously was very, very regressive because the richest person and the poorest person paid the same for uh, the same premium for their basic goods. Uh, so an income tax was passed, and the Supreme Court declared it unconstitutional. Then in the case of Lochner v. New York, when state legislatures tried to deal with some of these imbalances, including by passing a law that limited uh, industrial bakers' hours to 60 hours per week, the Supreme Court invalidated it, not only invalidated it, but said in a rather sweeping way that any uh, action, state action taken to protect labor was, was per se impermissible. John Marshall Harlan dissented in all of those cases. In most of them, four of those six cases I mentioned, he was the sole dissenter. And he dissented in a way that was predictive of everything that happened. You know, he was a man who was in touch with what he saw as national destiny, but also, you know, had a unique ability to understand how the decisions made by the Supreme Court would affect future generations. As we'll discuss later, that was something that I think came very clearly from his roots here in Kentucky. But when you look back on the record and you look back on the period of that time, one thing that leaps out is the centrality of the Supreme Court. You know, those pathologies that sort of developed in society that we now condemn, segregation and, and really, really excessive inequality, uh, they didn't come about because of some president and they didn't come about because of uh, Congress blocking something. They, they came about because of a series of Supreme Court decisions that could easily have gone the other way, easily. You, you could easily envision uh, it going the other way. Yet it did not, and only one person had the courage of his convictions to stand up and speak out against it. I first became interested in Harlan when I went to law school myself, and uh, you know it can be a fairly dry exercise studying constitutional law. You have this big case book in front of you, you read it. Uh, only a few dissents even make it into the case book, and, and Harlan's fame was such that he, his cases did, his dissents did make it into most of the case books. But they would sort of leap out at the page, be, uh, leap out at you because, you know, then in, in what was the late 20th century when I was in law school, um, here was a man who was right in the mainstream of legal thinking for, you know, 1990, who was saying those things in 1890. And you wonder what is it that enabled him to see things so differently from his colleagues and, and then be proven right over time. So that's the the mission that I set out for myself in, in writing this book, to try to answer that question. You know, what were the roots of Harlan's difference? Where did it come from? And a lot of the story, almost all of that story, comes back to Kentucky in a very powerful way. Let me tell you a little bit about the Harlan family, his branch of the Harlan family. He was born in 1833 in a place called Harlan Station that was basically a, a family town. It had been founded by his uh, grandfather and, and a great uncle uh, who had been pioneers, essentially, in Harlan Station. And uh, he was born, however, to a father who was already a very prominent man, had served in Congress, or would go on to serve in Congress, I think, when he was a young boy, um, but was also a leader in the state, very close friend and younger protege of Henry Clay, the greatest politician in Kentucky, real national leader. And uh, Rob, uh, James Harlan, uh, John's father, uh, had built already the largest private law library in the state, which of course helped his practice, but it was also a point of pride because he had a special reason to believe in the law. Clay, James Harlan, other leading families in Kentucky, the Crittendons, for example, all lived during that era under the shadow of what they saw as a coming civil war. Kentucky's right in the middle. You know, they can see the states' rights agitation in the South. They could see the abolitionist sentiments fomenting in the North. And they feared that because of geography, Kentucky would be trampled in the process. It would be the battlefield of that war. They also knew that Kentucky itself was divided. 
between northern and southern uh, sentiments. Its economy was also divided. You know, part of it looking a little bit like Ohio, some of it looking more like Tennessee. And, and they felt that this issue would, would tear apart the civic fabric of Kentucky. They knew that. That's why Kentuckians were always at the forefront of crafting compromises to prevent the Civil War. Compromises of uh, 1830, you know, that was Henry Clay's doing as a young man. Later, compromise in the 1850s, you know, he was uh, also taking the lead. Uh, and James Harlan, the father of John Marshall Harlan, was right there with him. And when John Marshall Harlan, from the time he was in his early 20s, he became a, a speaker and a politician, first on behalf of the Whig Party, which was Clay's party. So John, John Harlan in the 1850s was, was right there in that movement trying to prevent the Civil War, but also living as a, as a young man would with this, this tremendous sense of doom on his, on his shoulders. Now there was another facet of the Harlan family that's really worth noting, and that is there was another person living in that house who was very, very important and would go on to be a very important figure in American history. That's Robert Harlan, and Robert Harlan was enslaved in that house. And in later years, when he became a famous person, there were a number of newspaper profiles that were done about him. So we know a little bit about his background in his own perspective. And by uh, those accounts, Robert and his mother, who was also of uh, mixed race, um, had made a 460 mile perilous journey from Southern Virginia, which is where James uh, Harlan's mother's family had been from, to Harlan Station explicitly to find his father. Some of the accounts say that his father was dead when they arrived, they found his father was dead. Some of them say James Harlan himself was the father. Uh, but one way or the other, at age eight, Robert Harlan was brought into the Harlan family as an enslaved man. His mother ended up getting sold down south and nobody knows who was responsible for that transaction or how that happened. But he, he became the sort of special ward of James Harlan, of John's father. And John's father, by all accounts, had a very special feeling for Robert, to the point where he had nine children with his wife and uh, six sons, one of whom died in infancy. But the other five were treated um, uh, almost to this sort of cloistered regimen of, of study uh, designed to create what was almost like a family law firm. You know, he basically declared all of his sons were going to be lawyers and they were all going to start learning from an early age. But Robert Harlan could not learn because uh, uh, James, according to these stories, James tried to get him enrolled in school, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't teach an African-American. In an odd way, that, that liberated Robert, uh, freed him from uh, James Harlan's heavy hand in terms of studying for boys, and he actually developed a very important skill that would, would uh, hold him in good stead throughout his life. He learned to see places, to find places where African Americans could get an equal shot in society. And that was a tough thing to do when we're talking about the 1830s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Um, but one that he found was Kentucky horse racing. This was a sport that was just being invented and just being developed. A lot of the owners uh, were themselves slave owners and they would have their enslaved men work as trainers and jockeys. So for whether you're an enslaved man or in, in Robert's case though enslaved, living more as a free man because he, he was more treated as one of the family within the Harlands, he would travel the state uh, to stage races. And so if you imagine young John Marshall Harlan 16 years younger than Robert, as a little boy, looking up to Robert, who by all accounts was incredibly handsome and charismatic, you know, coming back on horseback from these races, leather pouch in his hand full of money, gun on his hip, you know, he was a romantic figure in a lot of ways, a, a charismatic figure to, to John Harlan during his upbringing. Now that skill that we were talking about that Robert Harlan developed about finding opportunities continued throughout his life. The next one he found was the gold rush in 1849. He understood innately that uh, there wasn't going to be the same racism out there in San Francisco because people coming in from all over the world, uh, Chinese, Mexicans, Europeans, all converging on San Francisco to try to make money. And when he heard about it, he you know, almost had that sort of uh, instinctive sense that he had to get out there. So he made a perilous journey through Panama went up the coast of uh, the west coast of the United States to get to San Francisco. Uh, mad rush, crazy scene. 
made money primarily selling supplies to people. He may also have been a prospector, but he came back with $60,000, the equivalent of four or five million dollars in, in money today, uh, which made him a very, very rich man in, in this community. He took his money and he moved to Cincinnati, which at the time, we're talking the very early 1850s, was the terminus of the Underground Railroad. Uh, and in those days before the Fugitive Slave Act, uh, black people could live freely in, San Francisco, in uh, Cincinnati. So he invested in businesses that were created by largely uh, uh, slaves who had been able to free themselves. Um, they, these included something as simple as uh, a grocery store and as, as complicated as a place called the Dumas House that was the leading hotel for black people in, uh, in Cincinnati, but also after the Fugitive Slave Act came in, it became a place where runaways were protected and hidden sort of in the basement levels. There were secret chambers in this hotel, and Robert Harlan held the mortgage on it. Um, he became a photography pioneer, uh, sensing, again, that new technology was a place where African Americans could compete. He then moved to Europe for, this, for what turned out to be the Civil War years. In 1858, he realized things were getting bad in Cincinnati for for black people and uh, took American horses uh, that he purchased himself and went to England to stage transatlantic races to try to prove that Kentucky bred horses were the full equal of new market bred horses in England. And believe me, the British took great notice. He's, his name was all over the British press and these races were very famous. He won a few of them, but was mostly unsuccessful in a lot of them. But he sort of emerged as a famous person throughout Europe. He traveled in France, he traveled in Ireland, he traveled all around England, and, and he was very respected. When he left England, there were very respectful notices in the British newspapers about Robert Harlan, who was such a, a by then, familiar figure at all these British race horses, race courses. He came back in, uh, after the Civil War to Cincinnati again, to become the leading black politician during that era when black rights were protected. And at that point, that conferred a, a position of national power on Robert Harlan because the African-American vote was what kept Republicans in power in Ohio, and Ohio was the swing state in presidential elections. So uh, there was all kinds of efforts on part of Ulysses S. Grant, of the other leaders during that time. They knew Robert Harlan personally. He played a role in developing an African-American political agenda, the first African-American political agenda after, after the Civil War. There were a series of national conventions that he was a major figure. The New York World, a newspaper, said his influence among African-Americans was second only to that of Frederick Douglass. He also stayed in close, positive relations with the Harlan family, um, despite what would seem to us to be sort of a shocking kind of imbalance of him having, having grown up enslaved and having faced uh, you know, intense racism at every juncture, he nonetheless retained a very strong family feeling towards, towards the Harlan children. And he always spoke reverentially about James Harlan as the man who raised him. Uh, when John Harlan became sort of the family star and the rising politician, Robert also helped, helped John. Uh, they worked together in the, uh, to pl help plan strategy for a candidate, Ben Bristow of Kentucky, for the uh, convention in 1876 in Cincinnati. There was an incident in Washington, D.C., where a Harlan family cousin from John's mother's side of the family shot a prominent African-American official in a private dispute that nonetheless was perceived as a racial dispute. And uh, the cousin and his lawyer shrewdly called John to try to help out, you know, citing family feeling, can you help your cousin's defense? Your cousin could, could uh, go to death for this. And um, uh, John apparently said yes, uh, but the rumor went around that he was gonna use his influence with the uh, Republican leaders of government who then controlled the judicial system in Washington, D.C. To try, to try to get his cousin freed. Robert, who had the shrewder political instincts in a lot of ways, knew that this was going to tarnish John's reputation tremendously because he, Robert, was friends with John Mercer Langston, who had founded the law school at Howard University, and Langston's wife. The man who had been shot was the brother-in-law of Langston's wife. He was so prominent in the black community. And in this, this era, when the black vote was very, very important to the Republicans, having John Harlan's name uh, be... Uh, maligned within the black community would, would be a serious political hit. So Robert himself journeyed to Washington and brokered a deal whereby the Harlan family agreed to have the cousin 
uh, that the cousin would never come back to Washington again if he were found guilty and pardoned uh, on the grounds that he was drunk during the time. And the, fortunately, the man who was shot recovered, so that took some of the pressure off of uh, the situation. And Robert sort of cleared the way or protected John's reputation, so John didn't have to be involved in that. Later on, uh, when John was a candidate for the Supreme Court through a very unusual series of circumstances that followed the disputed presidential election in 1876, the real question about him was Northern Republicans who were much more progressive on race didn't want anyone associated with the South or from a slave-owning family to be anywhere near the Supreme Court. And they repeatedly doubted, this is all documented in the record, that, that he would ever stick by the, the, what they saw as the verdict of the Civil War, that he would, he would be fighting against civil rights. Robert played a role, again, behind the scenes in helping John to get onto the Supreme Court by reassuring Republicans. You know, here was an African-American political leader who had grown up in the same home who was friendly and supportive of, uh, of John Harlan, and their politics were very, very closely entwined. So Robert played a role helping John clear his name first in this incident in Washington, but also in sort of behind the scenes helping him uh, to get on the Supreme Court. We don't know how instrumental that help was or anything like that, but you, you can sort of intuitively feel that it would have been, it would have been helpful <laughs> to have an actual African-American leader standing up for you and vouching for you when you had the, what was perceived as the taint of being, being a Southerner at that time. The big surprise and irony, of course, is that Harlan went on to not only be a supporter of civil rights, but eventually it was the northern justices that abandoned civil rights. You know, after that, that brief period when uh, African-American rights were protected, there was a, a very strong perception in the north, which was booming after the Civil War, that the, the only way to achieve reconciliation in the country was essentially to uh, negate African-American rights. Uh, and the Northern justices seemed to just look the other way in these cases. Uh, as I've told people along the lines, you know, I, I had expected the second half of the book to be a series of real clashes where you could get deep into these legal issues, look at each of these cases almost like a morality play, you know, fight out the legal issues. But when you read the majority opinions, the majority opinions, there isn't much there. I mean, they, they are abominations. You know, they, you know, racism sort of was the law in some of, those, uh, some of those opinions. There wasn't much to go on. There are some exceptions, I will say, because we have a lot of lawyers in the room, but you know, the civil rights cases of 1883, there was a respectable majority opinion from a legal point of view, uh, if not from a moral point of view, but a legal point of view. But many of them were just, uh, inconsequential legal arguments, and, and Harlan uh, towered above them. I mean, Harlan's dissents were smarter on the law, uh, wiser in terms of where the country was headed, and uh, uh, you know, far more uh, humane and in touch with sort of larger conceptions of justice. They easily confirmed these dissents, uh, you know, his, his greatness as a legal thinker and as a, as, a, as a moral man and as a prognosticator of the American future. Um, people often ask then, was it all Robert Harlan that accounted for his difference? I, I don't think so. I think that when you know somebody like Robert Harlan, you've seen somebody grow up in your own home, in your own environment, and see him achieve wealth and power against the most incredible of odds, you know, being born enslaved. You can't buy into these theories of racial superiority and inferiority and other things like that, that I think the Northern justices, who for all that they had these sterling abolitionist credentials, they really didn't have any familiarity with African Americans, and they kind of fell prey to those arguments, uh, while Harlan did not and could not because of Robert Harlan. But I think that what really made the difference for John Harlan was that formative experience in the years trying to avoid the Civil War. I think he came to believe that the compromises that he and his father and Clay and many others, Clay as the leader, uh, forged were honorable attempts. I, he never disavowed them at all, but I think he recognized that there are sometimes limits of compromise, limits to compromise, and sometimes you have to stand up strongly for, for a principle. And that's why he was able to do something that we would find very unusual or unfamiliar in today's society, he was able to be both a sort of fully realized, happy, mainstream man, you know, a father of six, man with a very happy marriage, um, 
uh, friendly with his colleagues, friendly with the bar association. He used to go to picnics in Washington and, you know, uh, always known as a great guy, a teacher, a mentor to young people. You know, he was a, a leader in the Presbyterian Church uh, for decades, National Presbyterian Church as well as uh, the New York Avenue Presen uh, Presbyterian Church in Washington. Um, and, and he was a, you know, a fully, happily, well-adjusted kind of person. And yet, within his role on the Supreme Court, he was a radical. You know, he was eccentric. He was out there. He took a dramatically different view on cases that had tremendous emotions behind them. You know, things that were of, you know, great passion. And normally you think of that person, the dissenter, as somebody who paid a terrible price, who was excluded, who was an outcast, who was an outsider. And people say, well, how could Harlan be both? And the answer is, I think that during that period before the Civil War and then fighting in the Civil War, I haven't even mentioned that he, he's played a crucial role in 1861 in keeping Kentucky neutral in the war. He then immediately uh, pulled together a, a much honored uh, Kentucky 10th Regiment that, uh, that fought on the Union side. He was the colonel, he was the commander, saw considerable combat, uh, describes arriving at Shiloh pretty much after the fighting had ended, but you know, stepping over bodies uh, left and right. When you have seen that level of disaster, and you can even trace it as he did in some of his later descents to the Dred Scott decision, to the Supreme Court itself. Uh, you know, he had been fighting all those years to, to uh, uh, forge these compromises, and then all of a sudden the Supreme Court comes in in the Dred Scott decision and says, um, African Americans were never intended to be part of the United States and will have no rights that white people will ever have to respect, even if they are free, even if they're free. I think Harlan knew as soon as that decision came down, and it was written by uh, Justice Tawney, Roger Tawney, who his family had reviled because he had replaced the sainted John Marshall for whom he had known, been named. Uh, I think he knew after Dred Scott that war was going to come and there was going to be a disaster for the United States. So he understood uh, innately the role of the Supreme Court, that when the Supreme Court gets something wrong, there's no recourse. In that case, no recourse except for war. So when some of these, this backsliding began on African American rights, there was not just uh, deeply unfair, and his opinions always had reference to people on the ground and to basic concepts of fairness, but he also understood that it rejected the, the plain language of the Constitution that, and the specific intent of the post-Civil War amendments in which Congress and the states envisioned exactly that situation, that the state would backslide, refuse to enforce Af uh, African American rights. The, the Constitution was amended specifically to address that problem. And yet, starting in 1883, it's, it's only John Harlan who's willing to stand up for those amendments. Everybody else has uh, abandoned the, the program and, and the Supreme Court is off uh, you know, making, making up the law on its own, essentially. So I think that when you have that sense of perspective from having seen the whole story unfold, you understand what the stakes are and you understand you can't just go along and get along. You can't waste your time on sort of purely academic disputes. You have, you have a sense of what counts and what doesn't count. And there are examples where Harlan did compromise on the bench, where he joined the majority in cases where he uh, took on the role of, of writing the opinion probably to sort of steer the case in a slightly different direction. So he was not a reflexive dissenter. But he was somebody who understood uh, the importance of of laying down a marker uh, and, and appealing to future generations. And we know from his uh, transcripts of his, his speeches as a law professor that he envisioned a, a future vindication, uh, that future generations would see things the way that he did. And, and that is exactly what happened. Uh, and the last part of the book sort of showcases sort of what happened after Harlan died, how his dissents particularly inspired uh, the civil rights lawyers of the 20th century, almost all African Americans. Um, one of the things that's been revealed to us because uh, black newspapers are now digitized from that era is just how much discussion there was within the black community about Harlan's dissents. They also tell us that when Harlan died in 1911, uh, while he got a very respectful send off by the mainstream media and the Courier Journal and other places, uh, but all around the country, um, 
African-American newspapers all around the country, including in cities that he never visited and had no personal connections to, deeply mourned him. And uh, there were spontaneous church services at that time for his soul that no white people ever attended. There were four of them in Washington, culminating in a, a joint uh, memorial service at Washington's Metropolitan AME, where Harlan did have an association. He had spoken several times at, at Metropolitan AME. Uh, and it was an all-black memorial service at which his dissents were read aloud. So if you imagine yourself as a young person in that church hall, listening to those words from Harlan's dissents, particularly from his dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson, the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. There is no caste here. You saw that at least one white person in a position of power could see things the way the African-American community did. And I think that helped keep the faith for many, many years, decades, until Thurgood Marshall, Constance Baker Motley, many other, uh, James Nabrit, uh, who later married into the Robert Harlan family, uh, their family line married into the Robert Harlan family line, uh, they had to go around the South and sort of uh, persuade people to be plaintiffs against uh, in, in anti-segregation cases, knowing that the Ku Klux Klan was there to take revenge, knowing that they'd be reviled. And I think, you know, Harlan's Descent, uh, which Constance Baker Martley said was Thurgood Marshall's Bible, Harlan's Descents were, were what persuaded people that it was possible, that it was worth sticking with the system, that eventually judges and Supreme Court justices could see things their way. Uh, and of course, they were, they were all right, and we have all uh, lived to benefit from it. Um, I urge people to, in reading the book, to you know, pay attention to Harlan's words, because very, it's very rare to have a Supreme Court justice who speaks as, as closely as he does to the underlying purpose of the law. And some of those quotes that I mentioned from the dissent in Plessy v. Ferguson, you know, they're the kind of things that you want to sort of etch on the wall of a building, because it, it sort of reminds people of why the law is there. You know, and, and who it's there to protect, and, and the importance of equality. And uh, now I'll, I'll welcome your questions, because I'm sure you have more, more thoughtful stuff to say. <laughs> Thank you. If you all want to go ahead and put some cards up in the air, uh, Laura, if you don't mind going and, and picking those up, that would be terrific. Let me start with someone you didn't mention a lot in this, but certainly was in the book, and that's his wife. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about her, Malvina, and of her influence in, in his life? Yeah, she did. I mean, she, she, she played a large, a large role in his wife. I, I, I spoke to their great-great-granddaughter who says that her name is pronounced Malvina, so you learn things all the time. Oops, Malvina. Called, Malvina also <laughs> all the time, too. Uh, Malvina Harlan. Um, she married John when she was very, very young. She was 17 and he was 21. And um, she uh, was known for her sort of uh, bright personality and also her intelligence. And she was uh, very much a confidant of his. Uh, she talked about at one point about how when he was about to make his first big break with his colleagues in the civil rights cases of 1883, which was a huge national requiem. You know, we think of now of Plessy v. Ferguson being the most famous case from that era. Actually, Plessy v. Ferguson kind of passed without notice, you know, without much notice. It was, it was noticed in the black community, but you know, the, you know, the case was set in New Orleans and the New Orleans newspapers didn't even give it its own headline. The civil rights cases of 1883, however, were front page news everywhere in the country. People were paying attention to it. This was the big ball game. You know, would they protect civil rights or not? Harlan had been on the court for six years, but had been a fairly um, anonymous justice. He had sort of been going along with the majority in a lot of ways. He was the youngest justice. He was, he was uh, cooperative with his colleagues in a lot of ways. And then suddenly, in this case, by far the most important case they'd ever confronted, uh, he broke with them in a powerful way, not just registering his dissent, but authoring a landmark uh, extremely long dissenting opinion that really, in many ways, forecast the uh, constitutional interpretation of the 1960s and, and helped to, to establish a groundwork for it. But he was struggling with that opinion, and his wife, uh, by her story, said that she had, um, she had secretly kept and hidden an inkwell that had been a part of the Supreme Court history that Justice Taney had used to write 
the Dred Scott opinion, which was this devastating opinion in Harlan's mind. Harlan had been a collector of uh, uh, historical artifacts, and he had collected it as a historical artifact, and apparently a, a niece of Tawny's wanted it back for the Tawny family, and Harlan graciously accepted. But Mrs. Harlan, Malvina Harlan, knowing how much it meant to her husband, hid it from him. So he was forced to tell the niece, oh my gosh, I must have misplaced it, don't know where it was, and she had secretly hidden it. And she said that she took it out and put it on the desk where he had been agonizing day and night with this opinion. And she said she put it down right in front of him and, and it inspired him to write it. And it inspired him because he knew that Dred Scott was a, a disastrous opinion and that what he was uh, writing in the civil rights cases of 1883 was he was imploring the court and the country not to repeat that mistake. And what that illustrates is First of all, her understanding of her husband and what would inspire him uh, and her willingness to kind of uh, be his supporter in every possible way, but also her own understanding of what was at stake in that case. And I think, you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about how Harlan managed to be both a, um, you know, a top, uh, fully uh, well-adjusted member of society, but also be a passionate outside dissenter at the same time. And to do that, you needed to have the support of your family. And it certainly goes back to his, his long, happy marriage to, to Malvina, who really was a partner to him. Uh, it also goes to uh, his children, who, who seemed to share all of his, his views. Not in every specific case. Uh, he had one son, James, who disagreed with him, on, for example, on the, on the Insular cases, which was uh, the cases that happened when the United States uh, took control of Hawaii and Puerto Rico and the Philippines, uh, and James was the uh, the Attorney General for Puerto Rico, and he was arguing with his father about whether Puerto Rico was ready to have full uh, rights under the Constitution, and uh, uh, Dad did not listen to his son in that case and insisted on the Constitution following the flag. He didn't win that. He was in dissent there uh, as well. But, but for the most part, the Harlan family strongly supported, uh, the, his immediate family strongly supported his, his views, and a lot of that goes back to his wife. Another question. As a historian, how surprised were you to unearth the now digitalized accounts of Robert Harlan's rise to prominence? What impact do you think this greater access to a treasure store of contemporaneous information will impact scholarship going forward? I think it will dramatically impact scholarship, and I think this is the big difference between this book and some of the earlier academic accounts of uh, Justice Harlan's career in that we know more both about Robert Harlan, but we also know more about the extent to which John Marshall Harlan's dissents were um, uh, discussed within the black community. Uh, and these newspapers are very sophisticated, well-written, beautiful uh, works of journalism that you know today's journalists uh, would be lucky to be able to write so well and so articulately as these uh, uh, these these journals were, um, and uh, and I think it, it it gives us a whole new window on figures, uh, mostly black figures who've been neglected uh, during segregation by the mainstream media, uh, but also the impact that certain white figures had within the black community that has also been shielded. Uh, in the case of John Marshall Harlan from 1911 until 1954, 1911 was when he died, and 1954 was the Brown versus Board of Education decision. There was very little discussion of Harlan. He was kind of forgotten, but he was, he was not forgotten within the black community, but it's just the walls of segregation were such that none of that discussion ever seemed to, uh, to go over the wall into the white community. Um, so I, I do believe that there's uh, a lot of importance and impact to having those, uh, those black papers uh, digitized. Next question. Can you talk a bit about Harlan Center education from a center alum? And I know who that is. There are several <laughs> there, but I know who this one is. Well, one, uh, here are some things that I think uh, it really uh, uh, affected him from his time at Center College. The, the biggest and most important one was they really emphasized uh, elocution and debate. So every week he was obliged to stand up and give speeches and to, uh, to debate issues. And uh, one thing that's very noteworthy is that for all that his father was a prominent man, James Harlan, a respected man, he was also known as a terrible speaker. And they kept, kind of would keep him away from any Whig rally because James Harlan was such a convoluted legal thinker that he couldn't really project passion, he couldn't really you know, make the argument. 
And then here's his son, John Harlan, who, first of all, is tutored at center, which, which absolutely emphasized the importance of public address and the importance of debate and the importance of making a strong presentation. And from age 22 and 23, he was heralded as, you know, a boy wonder dream orator, uh, you know, traveling the state uh, town by town at a time when you know, if people heard that a really interesting speaker was coming, they would they would absolutely crowd in. And from the youngest age, he developed this strong following and this great reputation. And I think a lot of that is attributable to his time at Center College. Another thing that Center College did is it, it reinforced his, uh, his Presbyterian religious values. And I am not a theologian, and I'm very, very reluctant to sort of start drawing big conclusions from... Uh, from theology, not because I, I don't think it was important to Harlan, because it was deeply important to Harlan, but it's just a very difficult thing to understand, and everybody's own experience of faith is is different, so it's, it's hard for us so many years later to, to try to draw conclusions uh, from it. Um, but the president of Center College was also his childhood minister and was an important sort of family friend uh, and figure. Um, they had... Um, uh, advanced an ideology, sort of religious ideology about master-servant relationships that uh, encouraged people to uh, treat enslaved people with much greater respect than was normally shown within that institution. Um, on the other hand, it was thought that some of that theology may also have prevented people from, uh, from being abolitionists because it emphasized that God had a plan for everything. So if people were deeply troubled by the institution of slavery in the 1840s, for example, in Danville, at Center College, uh, one of the arguments would have been, uh, God has a plan for this, it's, 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 it's not up to you. On the other hand, later in Harlan's life, people suggested that Harlan really believed in, in a, a sort of gospel of agency where, you know, where men can do God's work uh, here on the earth, and that he was inspired by uh, a belief that you know his views were favored by by God and were were uh, uh, part of his religious uh, mission and his religious commitment. Uh, Frederick Douglass spoke to that in a in in a letter to uh, to Harlan, which was very moving, where he said that. Um, after Harlan did uh, one you know lone dissent in one of the civil rights cases. Um, he said, uh, Douglas wrote to Harlan and said, you know, I always comforted myself in those terrible years before the Civil War uh, that one man with God is a majority, and you are a majority today, even though you're a sole dissenter on the Supreme Court. Uh, and I think Harlan believed that. I think he got some comfort from that. Another question. Did Justice Harlan's grandson, who later became a Supreme Court justice himself, also champion civil rights? He was, he was a moderate on civil rights and generally supportive of civil rights. Um, he was not the, uh, the crusader that grandpa was, uh, and he often made jokes about it. They were very, very different people, even though they knew each other. Uh, the second Justice Harlan was um, the sort of beloved namesake and sole only grandson of, of John Harlan. And in the summer, particularly before he died, he lived with his grandparents up in uh, Murray Bay where they would go for the summer, which is a place up in uh, Canada uh, where you would get you know, nice, cool summer weather. And uh, the grandson, who was 12 at the time, uh, sort of you know, studied under his grandfather, or at least had a lot of you know, comfortable time with his grandfather, long conversations and things like that. But he went on to be a very different kind of figure because he was a corporate attorney. He was an internationalist. Uh, the second Justice Harlan uh, had, was middle-aged already when World War II came along, uh, but, but became a flyer in England. He was so moved by the plight of England that he volunteered. Um, and he then, when he was nominated for the Supreme Court in the 1950s, the big knock on him was that he was too internationalist. Grandpa Harlan, who was born at a time when there were literally Revolutionary War veterans still alive, had a, a suspicion of Britain uh, that, that can echo in some of his opinions. So, uh, you know, they were very, very different people uh, in a lot of ways, but, uh, but grandson Harlan more or less uh, upheld the commitment to civil rights without being uh, the kind of, you know, emotional dissenter that his grandfather was. And just a couple more questions. Can you speak to the influence that Harlan may have had on Brandeis? 
Well, I don't, you know, this is very interesting because uh, I don't know enough about Brandeis's career to, you know, really give a, a deep, uh, deep interest. One area where they do have a point of connection is that uh, Louis Brandeis was, was passionate and involved in antitrust cases. And uh, Harlan, a significant part of Harlan's legacy uh, that is, is not especially often discussed is his belief in um, the Sherman Antitrust Act. Uh, he was the sole dissenter in a case called E.C. Knight in which the Sugar Trust had controlled 98% of uh, all sugar production in the United States. And clearly, um, it, it, was, it was well discussed that they were trying to take over each manufacturer of sugar in order to be able to control prices and uh, control wages for workers. Uh, and it was such an egregious situation that even the Cleveland administration, which was very pro-Wall Street and reluctant to enforce the Sherman Antitrust Act, decided to bring a prosecution. And the Supreme Court, which at the time was made up of very conservative former corporate attorneys who had really spent their whole careers arguing against regulation of business, uh, they just decided, they, they claimed that even though it controlled 98% of the production of sugar, it didn't really control prices. And it was, it was a very uh, obtuse kind of, kind of opinion where they were trying to say, well, there's no evidence in the incorporation documents that they intend to control prices and things like that. And, you know, Harlan uh, was the, uh, the sole dissenter, but he kind of, you know, blew his lid on this saying, you know, come on, do you really expect them to put in the incorporation documents that they're going to be uh, controlling prices here? You know, we have these combinations that are, are uh, distorting the economy and you're depriving the federal government of the ability to deal with this uh, very obvious problem. And Harlan, in his time, this is one example where his dissents did not have to wait until after he died to have an effect. You know, he actually was able to change the minds of some of his colleagues on this. And by the time that he died, about 15 years later, the court, including many of the same justices, had really changed their view and had become much more accepting of, of antitrust protections. Uh, but that's, that's one point of commonality between him and Brandeis. Uh, I think Brandeis was an admirer of Harlan, but I, uh, and, and uh, as, as Laura and others have said that when, um, when uh, Brandeis was a young man living in Boston, he got to know uh, very briefly the a Harlan daughter who died, who died young, but she and her husband for about a year, they probably overlapped in Boston and were friends. Uh, but uh, beyond that, I don't, I don't know enough about uh, Brandeis's career to say for sure whether he revered Harlan. We not. have three more, so I'm going to get to all these really quickly. So acknowledgments, notes, bibliography, 117 pages, or any of the links to the documents available to the public to read? Uh, yes, if you get on newspapers.com, which does cost a little bit of a fee, you can go up and look up a lot of those, those, those are newspaper uh, links and, and listings. So. Yes, they are, they, are, they are quite available. Some of the um, more obscure ones may be in local libraries and things, so newspapers.com will probably get you about 60 or 70 percent of those. Whose seat uh, did Harlan take on the court? Who holds it now? Did he ever meet Abe Lincoln or Cassius Clay? Oh, yeah. He, uh, the seat that he took was David Davis, who had been a friend of... Uh, a friend of Lincoln's and had been a Lincoln appointee on the court, and he left the court uh, to because because Illinois made him senator. And there's a long, complicated backstory that involves the disputed election of 1876, where David Davis was the only nonpartisan judge. Uh, and so, when they set up the electoral commission to judge, to assess the disputing claims in three southern states between. Republicans and Democrats, and uh, uh, it was a, you know, it was a huge uh, situation because the Republicans uh, who had their slate showing their candidate winning would point out that African Americans and you know Northern carpetbaggers who'd come down to the South were forcibly kept from polls and were, in some cases, shot if they tried to vote and things like that. On the other hand, the Democrats claimed that. There were all these restrictions on former Confederates voting and oaths that people had to take, and there was no suggestion that the state itself was uh, a Republican state. So you had all these competing, competing claims in three Southern states. And uh, so they set up a commission that was uh, made up of half Democrats, half Republicans, and David Davis with the idea that he was like the one trusted figure. And then Illinois, in Illinois, the Democrats like uh, legislature elects him senator, which may have been an attempt to try to influence his views on the panel. And he became so uh, 
he felt so maligned by the suggestion that he was uh, being bought off uh, that he uh, recused himself, which only furthered the crisis. Uh, but he did leave the Supreme Court to join the Senate. That opened a seat. And then part of the sort of behind the scenes backroom dealing in 1876 was uh, Republicans trying to find ways to sort of appease the South uh, given the, the very serious disputes and the you know, rather serious case that Hayes really had not won the presidency properly. Uh, and one of those backroom promises was to put a Southerner on the court, which was all Northern justices. And Hayes then turned to Harlan. He had a political debt, uh, owed a political debt to Harlan, but, but beyond that, Harlan was really the only person, Southerner, or sort of quasi-Southerner from Kentucky, who um, was considered acceptable enough to Northern Republicans to be put on the Supreme Court. All right, final question. An amazing number of attorneys have never heard of John Marshall Harlan, but even lay people know Oliver Wendell Holmes, his contemporary on the Supreme Court. Will your book reverse this situation, especially if Netflix or others make a movie series? And is that in the works? Can well, that would be great. <laughs> <laughs> so nothing in the works? Uh, uh, if Netflix is listening, you know, it's, it would be a great series. <laughs> and uh, there are some people who've shown some interest in that. But at this stage, you know, it's, it's a real shot in the dark whether anything ever gets made. And you have to find the right people. The right people have to be inspired by the story to tell it. But this is the kind of story that I think people could be inspired to tell that way. I do believe that Harlan's reputation has been occluded somewhat by the cult of Oliver Wendell Holmes. And part of it is that Holmes was such a great legal theorist, a great writer, a great uh, thinker about the law, but, but I think lacked the sort of the grounding in the moral grounding, the larger sense of justice that Harlan had. But if you think about it, legal history has kind of become the province of law schools and, and uh, lawyers. And there's something flattering to them in Oliver Wendell Holmes, that it's all a matter of sort of neutral principles and you know, the, these legal cases are puzzles that need to be figured out and articulated beautifully. And I think that uh, there's something about, about Holmes that attracts the, uh, the legal scholar a little bit more strongly than Harlan, whereas the actual historian looks, looks probably more strongly at, at Harlan. So I, I do hope that this book uh, gives Harlan his due, even in comparison to Oliver Wendell Holmes, though I, and by no means do I uh, mean to diminish Holmes. <laughs> I think that uh, he was a great justice, but Harlan was a greater justice. Final question for me. If you had to cast John Harlan, who would it be? Yeah, I know. We, we were trying to think about that a little bit earlier. I think you'd have to have like a, a young, you know, uh, like one of the Chris's, you know, there's one of the, you have to play the young Harlan and somebody like, you know, maybe Hugh Bonneville who was in uh, British, but he could play the older justice. Uh, I didn't know if you already had your eye on somebody. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> well, thank you, Peter, very much. Thank you, audience, for coming. We want to let you know there will be a link to this program that will eventually be on the Fraser website later this week. Peter, thank you so much. What a delight to meet you and to learn more about the book. And if you haven't read it, we do have copies for sale in the bookstore. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Thank you, everybody.